on February 5, 2023, shortly after the opening of the Chinese stock market, over a thousand stocks hit the daily limit, down in both the Shanghai and Shenzhen exchanges. More than 2,000 company stocks also had the same fate, causing widespread panic among investors. There was lots of good news, significant good news over the weekend, like reserve requirement cuts, like about a trillion or something. But in the blink of an eye, it all backfired. And in the end, over 1,300 stocks hit the limit down. How many times in the history of the market have we seen such a scenario of countless stocks hitting the limit down? I've only been in the stock market for three years, but this time I faced the worst stock and bond market conditions ever. There's simply no sign of stability in this wave of decline. They always say that when it goes down to a certain point, someone will step in, or how things will not be all that bad. But reality has already proven that it is not the case. I invested 2 million yuan and now I'm left with only 90. I never imagined I could lose so much money trading stocks. I don't even know what kind of market this is. Others are doubling their earnings while I'm doubling my losses. Maybe I'm the one that needs to change. Subsequently, economic experts have bluntly stated that the stock market crash can be seen as yet another sign of China's rapidly declining economy. Meanwhile, there are indicators that American banks have lost confidence in the Chinese market as well. During the stock market crash in China and Hong Kong, three informed sources revealed to Reuters that Bank of America announced the decision to lay off about 20 senior bankers in Asia on January 23rd this year. According to sources, the bankers affected by the layoffs were mostly based in Hong Kong, where they were primarily involved in Chinese operations. The bank also made some reductions in other Asian markets. As for the reason behind the layoffs, the sources mention that the decision came at a time when stock markets in mainland China and Hong Kong had reached their lowest point in recent weeks, severely impacting the trading prospects of investment banks. Reality indeed matched up. Throughout the past year of 2023, the prospect of economic recovery in China became a pipe dream. Coupled with escalating geopolitical tensions, foreign investors have been withdrawing from mainland China in mass, sparking a wave of layoffs across the financial sector. Bank of America has become the first major multinational bank to scale back on regional investment banking in 2024. Other financial corporations like Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, and Morgan Stanley collectively laid off over 10,000 positions in several rounds of layoffs in 2023. However, Bank of America did not do so. Although the number of employees at Bank of America had been declining over the past 12 months, according to CEO Brian Monahan, the bank mainly achieved this by not retaining vacancies left among departing employees. He also mentioned during the bank's fourth quarter earnings call that Bank of America had reduced its workforce by 5,000 employees over the year without incurring significant severance costs. This was a strategy to streamline the bank's structure and cut extra salary costs a distinctive approach to layoffs compared to other banks' mass redundancies. The layoff of 20 senior bankers by Bank of America raises a question of whether the bank is giving up on the Chinese market. For most foreign banks, it's hard to say they will immediately abandon the Chinese market. Instead of giving up, they might be shifting towards more reliable markets. After the three-year pandemic and the Ukraine war, American banks have become aware that doing business in communist or authoritarian countries come with a price. Media reports around September 2022 mentioned that leaders from J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, and Citigroup pledged to comply with any U.S. government requirements to withdraw from China if Beijing attacks Taiwan. Brian Monahan, CEO of Bank of America, also said, we'll follow the government's guidance, which has been for decades to work with China. If they change their position, we will immediately change it, just as we did in Russia. Oppenheimer senior analyst Chris Kotowski stated that China has always been viewed as more of a future growth opportunity, but the current geopolitical risks might make them more cautious about their investments in China. Kotowski also remarked, if you're a CEO and you're testifying before Congress and the question is basically, what if China's the next Ukraine? 
it's going to make you want to go very slowly, very deliberately, and make sure you don't have too much capital exposed there for now. From the American banker's point of view, it's clear that Bank of America, along with other banks, are concerned about the current political situation in China. Various other banks seem to be fully prepared to withdraw from China. Moreover, commitments from J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, and Citigroup to follow U.S. orders to leave China, coupled with ongoing bank layoffs and strategy shifts, have given subtle hints at the CCP possibly preparing or having already started actions against Taiwan. It's difficult to predict the next political aggression by the CCP, but it's clear that China's economy is now precarious, with normal business operations or the safety of corporate funds no longer insured. Plainly put, as long as the CCP still rules China, it's not a suitable place for business. In contrast to the pessimistic outlook of the Chinese market, Bank of America reported a rebound in transaction volume in its domestic business in the fourth quarter, approaching a 7% increase in investment banking fees, totaling $1.1 billion. On January 23rd this year, Citibank's subsidiary in China announced that, starting from May 6th this year, Citibank China's personal credit cards would no longer have the transactional function. At that time, it will no longer be usable for transactions such as consumer payments. Additionally, the bank will gradually cease providing related product benefits and services. It is understood that Citibank China has also reached an agreement with Taiwan Fubon Bank. After the repayment service of Citibank China's personal credit cards is stopped, the remaining installment payment balances, or debts, will be transferred to Fubon Bank. And then, after the service termination date, those remaining installment payment balances, or debts, will need to be repaid to Fubon Bank after the agreed-upon date. In the announcement, Citibank China also detailed the credit card transaction functions and related product benefits and services that will cease from May 6. These services include all types of transactions such as credit card swiping, automatic payment deduction, third-party payments, as well as cash advance service, installment service, and card renewal or application services. This marks part of Citibank's exit from the personal banking business in the Chinese market. However, mainland media reports observed that Citibank China had already signaled to halt even before the official announcement to terminate credit card transaction function services. In April 2021, Citibank announced a global strategic adjustment to exit the personal banking business in over a dozen markets, including China. By December of the following year, Citibank had announced the gradual closure of its personal banking business in mainland China, which did not affect its market-leading corporate business. In October of last year, Citibank further announced the sale of its personal banking wealth management business in mainland China to HSBC's subsidiary in China. This deal involved deposits in investment management assets totaling about $3.6 billion. The terms of the transactions were not disclosed, expected to complete in the first half of 2024. In fact, Citibank has been continuously adjusting its business operations in the mainland market, sparking widespread public discussions in the past year. In response, Citibank issued a statement in early November last year clarifying, Today's announcement progresses the wind-down of Citi's consumer banking business in China, which was announced in December 2022. Citi first announced its plan to exit China consumer banking in April 2021 as part of the firm's broader global strategy refresh. This announcement does not include Citi's institutional businesses in China, where the bank has a leading position. Public data shows that Citibank entered the Chinese market as early as 1902 and established the local entity of Citibank China in 2007. Currently, Citibank serves about 70% of the Fortune 500 companies in China, more than 300 local large enterprises, and numerous emerging medium-sized businesses. Citibank also operates a company in mainland China that primarily provides financial information services. Citibank currently has about 7,500 employees in China spread across 12 cities. In 1902, Citibank of New York opened its first branch in Shanghai, marking Citibank's first entry into China. On April 2, 2007, Citibank officially established a local entity in China called Citibank China Company Limited, 
becoming one of the first global banks registered in mainland China. That same year, Citibank became the first bank in China to offer global fund investment services. Since then, it has opened branches in 12 cities across China, including Beijing, Shanghai, and Chengdu. As a multinational bank that has been in mainland China for over two centuries, Citibank's gradual withdrawal from the Chinese personal business market prompts reflection on the reasons behind this move. Citibank ended its personal business operations in many countries, but its exit from China suggests that the services provided to Chinese depositors no longer yield corresponding returns. In October 2020, Westpac Bank of Australia mentioned on its official website that after assessing different global operations, it would withdraw business in China and other Asian markets and focus on domestic clients and clients in New Zealand instead. In early January this year, Standard Chartered China closed its online credit card application channel. Afterwards, starting February 20th, they also temporarily ceased accepting credit card applications through all channels. The bank stated it was optimizing application channels, but until now, Standard Chartered China has not reopened its online credit card application channel yet. On November 18th, 2022, Nanyang Commercial Bank also closed its Laoshan branch in Qingdao. Announcing the closure of business and stopping deposit intake, it's evident that numerous prominent multinational banks are accelerating their withdrawal from China. Citibank is not the only one. So why are there so many financial institutions putting in considerable effort to exit the Chinese market? For businesses, profitability is the first priority. Current data shows that China's banking sector is dominated by commercial banks. For Chinese commercial banks. Profits mainly come from corporate businesses, including major assets, turnover, and net profit. Many banks are transitioning to retail banks. However, this transformation is a great challenge considering the dispersed customer base, low volume of business, and the natural higher risks of retail banks. It's challenging enough for Chinese local banks to develop sales-oriented banking, let alone foreign banks without the local advantages to grow personal business operations. Moreover, although there's a vast market for sales-oriented banks in China, it's not an area that can yield short-term benefits. These factors likely played a role in Citibank's exit from personal banking operations in China. Furthermore, a more significant reason is a concerning economic outlook in China. The Citibank's exit from China indicate that the financial capabilities and purchasing power in China are declining. This hypothesis is hard to dismiss. With the current situation in China, since the outbreak of COVID-19 in Wuhan in 2019, China's economy has entered a prolonged recession. With the general population facing financial constraints, banks are finding it challenging to generate profits. Currently, China's economy faces both internal and external challenges. Internally, the downturn of China's real estate sector is underway, as real estate is a major source of national income. Its collapse will inevitably have a significant impact on China's economy, with the financial difficulties of leading real estate companies like Evergrande and Country Garden. China's economy has started to unravel. China's electric vehicle industry, as pushed by the government, also faces challenges due to battery safety concerns, with the sales outlook for various brands significantly worsening. The Chinese government hoped to carve a niche in the electric vehicle industry. Utilizing its capacity for cheap battery manufacturing, now with this pathway blocked, China's electric vehicle development lacks a strong foundation and advanced technology. With many companies hoping to grab a share of the fierce competition, even the smartphone company Xiaomi has started manufacturing electric vehicles with some models priced higher than some Tesla models. Most of these companies are just looking to make quick money regarding the electric vehicle trend. They are not exactly interested in producing quality electric vehicles. This reflects a general situation under the CCP, where people prioritize profits over corporate ethics and moral values. Lastly, from a consumer's perspective, the purchasing power of the Chinese population has remained weak. More and more experts are openly confirming that the claim of at least 600 million people in China earning less than 1,000 yuan, about 140 U.S. dollars a month. Is accurate, and this trend is only getting worse. According to media reports, after January first, twenty twenty-three, twenty-three states in the U.S. 
announced minimum wage increases. Michigan's hourly wage increasing by 50 cents to $10.10, and Nebraska's by $1.25 to $10.50, benefiting approximately 8.4 million Americans. The monthly income earned by hardworking Chinese does not even match the hourly wage of an American in two days. China's population is roughly three to four times that of the U.S., which is about 330 million. Even if the U.S. were to pay wages to four times as many people, it would still surpass China by a long shot. The excuse of having a larger population cannot justify low wages and weak consumer spending in China. When examining the Chinese economy from these angles, regarding the retreat or downsizing of operations by American banks and the current conditions within China, it becomes clear that China's economy has experienced a significant downturn, and the market potential in China has already been depleted by internal consumption driven by the CCP.